and lamotrigin is a category C drug. That's why we say that a drug of choice for epilepsy in pregnancy now is lamotrigin. So that's why I did not mention it then. Hi, welcome again. Uh, let's see the drugs in pregnancy and what are the drugs which can be safely given to pregnant women? The drugs which can be given with some caution, drugs which can be a problem in the fetuses but still have to be given because the benefits are better than the rest and some drugs which are not to be given at all. So yes, drugs in pregnancy by the FDA have been categorized from A to X. Not of course like uh, A to all the alphabets still X of course. It means A, B, C, D and the category X. So there are five categories. So category A drugs are safe in pregnancy. These are the drugs which are safely given like the thyroxin if you want to give in pregnancy and uh, <clears throat> the multivitamins, folic acid. In in therapeutic doses, if these drugs are given, they have no problems whatsoever. So these are the safe drugs in pregnancy. Now the category B drugs, they have some adverse effects. Some adverse effects are present in the animal model, but all studies, all studies in humans are safe. So yes, there may be some problems in the animals, but most of the studies on humans have shown these drugs to be safe. These are quite a few antibiotics like the penicillins and the cephalosporins, the antivirals like the didanosin and the drugs like, yes, metronidazole comes here. It's a category B drug. That's why we say that uh, in bacterial vaginosis, the drug of choice in pregnancy is indeed metronidazole. And uh, uh, drugs like uh, nitrofurantoin. So these are drugs which are safe in most of the animal models, but a few animal models they have shown uh, uh, adverse effects, and in animal in human models they are all safe. Now category C drugs. These are known teratogens known teratogens in animals, but very inadequate, inadequate human studies. So I would want to know what is the effect of these drugs on the humans, but uh, the studies are inadequate. Animals, it is teratogenic, but in humans, it are they are inadequate studies. And a few studies in which we have uh, seen these drugs when they are used in humans, in the few studies which we have, they have been mostly safe. So yes, uh, if it is a teratogenic in an animal and I have no studies in humans, then I would not actually use. So yes, I'll revise most animal studies. It is teratogenic. And a few studies done in humans, it is safe, but the studies are inadequate. So this is that gray zone kind of uh, uh, category, the category C. And you know what? This is the most common drugs used. The most common drugs used in pregnancy come in this. So these are the drugs like the uh, deworming drugs like the mebendazole and the albendazole and the acyclovir, the chloroquine. So what are the drugs which are the category D? Now D category drugs are known human teratogens, known human teratogens. And these are the drugs like the anti-epileptics and the anti like quinine. So I know they are teratogenic drugs, but uh, uh, some anti-epileptics have to be given for making a person have the adverse effects of having an epileptic fit. So we must control the epilepsy at the risk of the baby having, uh, in a few instances, having side effects. So the meaning of this is that the benefits, benefits of these drugs outweigh the risks of these drugs. 
So when the benefits are more than the risks, I would go ahead and give these drugs. So the antiepileptics like the phenytoin and the carbamazepine, these were drugs which were in fact uh, given in pregnancy even even now they are given in pregnancy like carbamazepine is given in pregnancy and uh, um, we know that they are known teratogenic drugs but the benefits of the drugs are better than the side effects so we go ahead and give them uh, telling the patient that there is a calculated risk but yes now we have in antiepileptics we have a drug called lamotrigin and lamotrigin is a category C drug. That's why we say that a drug of choice for epilepsy in pregnancy now is lamotrigin. So that's why I did not mention it then. So that we remember that yes, carbamazepine till I, I think around four years back, I used to teach in my classes that this is the drug of choice, although it has got teratogenic side effects. But now we have lamotrigin. It has some uh, nasal defects as a problem, lamotrigin, but then this is known to be a uh, not a very high incidence. So that's why from category B, category D, it was uh, pulled up to category C in the FDA. So uh, these are the category D drugs and uh, we give them because the benefits are more than the risk. Now what are the category X drugs? Now category X drugs are the ones which I will not give. They are the known teratogenic drugs. known teratogens and the risks outweigh the benefits. And this is a very, very long list, but I'll tell you a few. And most of these uh, things like the alcohol and the androgens, vitamin A, you know, if you want to remember a few drugs with A, and uh, lithium and radioiodine. And the cancer chemotherapeutic drugs and the uh, tetracyclines. So, uh, there are many more, but these are drugs which are known teratogens, and I would not want to give them in pregnancy at all. So, these are the drugs uh, which are the categories uh, in pregnancy. Of course, you must go into your books and read about uh, a little bit more about their uh, um, the list and the number of uh, drugs in each category. Try and increase the knowledge of your list of these drugs. Now, uh, let me tell you a few uh, uh, particular. Uh, drugs with their side effects. We were discussing about alcohol. Now, alcohol is totally contraindicated in pregnancy and uh, a lot of people say that there is some safe limit of alcohol in pregnancy. I'm so sorry, there is nothing like that. Especially a lot of people uh, used to have this binge eating and binge uh, drinking in alcohol in the first trimester and those have been, uh, you know, the baby would look apparently normal but as the baby grows up, there is a lot of mental retardation and there are a lot of structural defects as well which can come with alcohol. So, I'll just list a few uh, uh, problems with alcohol first. So, <clears throat> so fetal alcohol syndrome, to diagnose the fetal alcohol syndrome, all these three categories are required. That is, they are dysmorphic, they are dysmorphic uh, facial features like small palpable fissures, the, the palpable fissure, the opening of the eye, the palpable fissure is small, thin vermilion border, this uh, border on the upper lip, thin vermilion border and a smooth philtrum. This philtrum is smooth, you know, it's like like this, the face is like that. So, smoothing of the philtrum and thin vermilion border and small palpable fissures. And uh, prenatal or postnatal growth impairment, that is characteristic and uh, central nervous system abnormalities. Now, at least one of these uh, three, uh, one of these is required like structural head size is smaller than the 10th percentile and uh, there is significant brain abnormality on the imaging. Plus there might be global cognitive or intellectual defects that this person is mostly mental retarded. Quite a few of them have mental retardation. So all of these are required, one, two and three and in the category one, the dysmorphic facial features, all three are required for the diagnosis of the fetal alcohol syndrome. Now in the fetal alcohol syndrome, you have some structural defects also which can happen. So the alcohol related birth defects can be the cardiac defects like the uh, atrial septal defect or the ventricular septal defect, skeletal defect like the radio ulnar synostosis and joint contractures. 
aplastic or hyperplastic kidneys and uh, strabismus that is squint, ptosis, optigno hyperplasia and conductive or neurosensory hair loss. Like I was telling you, there are a lot of uh, neurological problems in uh, alcohol related uh, 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 teratogenicity. So, conductive or neurosensory hearing loss, and then there are these minor defects like hyperplastic nails, clinodectyly, that is, small digits, and uh, pectus carinator, pectus excavatum, and hockey stick palmar creases. You know, the palmar crease is like a, you know, this crease is like a hockey stick. Uh, if you see the palm, then the crease which is coming from the side of the palm from the palm is like this, you know, the, the hockey stick uh, palmar creases and railroad ears, you know, the creases in the ears are like railroad. I'll try to show you if there's a picture here, see, this creases like railroad, parallel uh, features, so a uh, parallel uh, creases, so that is like a railroad. So these are the alcohol related uh, problems which you can see, I, if you want to, uh, you know, write down the list. Yes, so the alcohol related problems make us uh, show, make us decide that surely we are not going to give this drug, this alcohol uh, any any time in pregnancy. Now what happens in some other defects uh, which I want to tell you, I will take out this. So uh, what is the uh, effects of warfarin? Now warfarin is a uh, anticoagulant which is a very potent anticoagulant but since it has got a very low molecular weight and it is re readily crossing the placenta it readily crosses the placenta, it causes a lot of embryopathy. So, uh, this uh, anticoagulant used to be given as a DVT prophylaxis and also given in patients who have got uh, these uh, mitral wall replacement to prevent thromboembolic phenomena. So, this can cause this uh, warfarin embryopathy if it is specially given in the first 6 to 9 weeks. That is the time when there is the maximum, this MCQ has come, warfarin embryopathy is a favorite MCQ. So, from the 6 to the 9 weeks, if it is given, then a lot of embryopathy can happen and stippling of the epiphysis. This is the one um, MCQ line which always comes stippling, I think it came in the last year's AIMS exam, stippling epiphysis and hyperplastic nose. So, that is what is very uh, specific for warfarin embryopathy with depression of the nasal bridge. So, hyperplastic nose, depression of the nasal bridge and stippling of the epiphysis is the warfarin embryopathy. And uh, let us see another drug, uh, lef leflunomide. Leflunomide is a drug which is given. Now, this is a new drug which has come in the list of things and uh, I am sure that in um, maybe it has come earlier, I have not come across, maybe pharmacology people have come across this question. But yes, this is one drug which is now a problem which is probably going to come in your exams very soon. A pyrimidine synthesis inhibitor treatment for rheumatoid arthritis it is used for. It is a good drug for the treatment. But yes, the problem is if you are using this drug for the uh, women who are in the childbearing age because this is detectable in the plasma for up to two years. Now, that is the problem, up to two years. So, it is associated with multiple abnormalities like the hydrocephalus and the eye anomalies, skeletal abnormalities and embryonic death. These all can happen with this leflunomide. So, up to two years. So, even if uh, suppose a woman is planning a pregnancy and she was on leflunomide for, leflunomide for rheumatoid arthritis treatment, she must actually wait for two years before she plans a pregnancy. So yes, that is not practical. So we have a cholestyramine treatment washout for this. So cholestyramine treatment is known to uh, bind with this leflunomide and take it out from the circulation of the woman. So yes, if she must use leflunomide and she must try pregnancy, cholesterol wash out and uh, repeat the values after 14 days and uh, once the levels are of these drugs are undetected in the circulation then we can ask the woman to try pregnancy and uh, another drug is the fetal hydantoin syndrome the phenytoin injection you know the phenytoin all of you know that uh, it is an anti epileptic which should not be preferably given in pregnancy so the question which has come to you many times is a woman is pregnant on phenytoin already. So, when she is already on phenytoin, what are you going to do if she comes to you at 8 weeks or 9 weeks? Then there is no point changing the drug. If she is already pregnant and she is on phenytoin, even if you stop the drug, it is going to take another 1 month for the drug to wash out from the system. So, we always say these anti epileptics, if you must stop, you must stop at least 3 months before she is planning a pregnancy. We always say, and a woman with epilepsy, she 
better not get pregnant just when she decides to get pregnant. She must always visit a gynecologist and discuss the drugs she's taking or a neurologist who is giving her the drugs and plan a pregnancy. And at least three months of washout period is given when all these steroidogenic drugs are given like carbamazepine or phenytoin. So yes, if she's already on phenytoin and she's conceived, then there's no point changing the phenytoin. And uh, yes, around 5% and less women uh, are going to have children with a, which are affected. So the benefits are more than the risks, like we said, and you continue the phenytoin. But yes, the problems of this fatal hydantoin syndrome, which is same to the uh, ingestion with carbamazepine also. Please remember, fetal hydantoin syndrome is caused by phenytoin, but it is also caused by carbamazepine. So the features are the upturned nose uh, and the mid-facial hyperplasia, long uh, upper lip with thin vermilion borders and digital hyperplasia. So when there is these, we say it is uh, because of carbamazepine or because of uh, phenytoin ingestion in the mother. So these are the drugs which we wanted to discuss. Of course, uh, it'll be good if you can go and read about a few more drugs which are uh, rarely asked in uh, your exams and uh, they can never be a full list that we can discuss. All right. Thank you.